Hello and welcome to Need to Know, the series which tackles the big issues in education, focusing on the key changes coming up in the months ahead that will affect children's education and your working lives. We'll be tackling a range of issues, including the new Key Stage 3 curriculum, discipline powers for teachers, healthy eating in schools, diplomas and plans to raise the education leaving age. But first, to guide us through changes coming into effect in September about the way we teach and assess the very youngest children, I'm joined by the man who can tell you what you need to know, education writer and broadcaster Mike Baker. Mike. Thank you, Sheena. Well, back in 2005, when the plans were first unveiled for the Early Years Foundation stage, the headlines talked about Big Brother and babies being taught to speak by state diktat. It was inevitably, I suppose, dubbed the National Curriculum for Toddlers. Some critics said it would stifle the creativity of teachers and childminders who they said were better placed to know how to develop young minds than experts in Whitehall. Many others, though, welcomed this new and legally enforceable framework based on what was considered best practice. So what do the plans really mean for you and the under fives? Well, for the first time, all very young children will be legally covered by the Early Years Foundation stage from September 2008. It sets out the requirements for the safe and supportive care and the learning and development needs of children from birth to five. It details the statutory requirements for all early year settings, covering safe environments and staffing, and the phases and themes for the way these children will learn, develop and be assessed. Until now, the learning and assessment of children from birth to three was covered only by voluntary guidance. This new foundation stage brings them and three to five year olds together under a single umbrella. It will affect childminders, nursery nurses and teachers in all registered early year settings. It will have the same force in law as the national curriculum. So a new set of legally enforceable rules for nursery schools and childminders involving of course Ofsted inspection and the risk of a poor report if you fall short. So why the change? Well, the answer is that the government has been convinced by research that it's vital to make sure every child gets a good developmental start and ministers decided that the current advisory arrangements needed formalising. Despite the criticism from some quarters, the Department for Children, Schools and Families insists this is not about centralised control. Rather, they say it's about bringing together the very best practice already found in our nurseries and making sure that all children, whatever their background, are educated to the same high standard. Now, the message is get them early if you want to really tackle educational inequality and improve the attainment levels of the most disadvantaged in society. So the new framework sets out six areas of learning and development to be covered in early years setting. They start with personal, social and emotional development, covering areas like self-confidence and relationships. That's followed by communication, language and literacy, and problem-solving, reasoning and numeracy, which between them cover the beginnings of English and maths. The remaining themes are developing a knowledge and understanding of the world, that's things like time and place and physical and creative development covering body and mind. Now, there's a lot of detail about what should be covered, although the emphasis is on learning through play, not through formal lessons. The most controversial bit, though, is the new rules on assessment. Now, despite the lurid headlines, it should be stressed that this is not about formal tests or the three plus, as one newspaper put it. Rather, it requires the recording of systematic observations of what children are able to do. Ministers say it'll all be very useful for making sure that every child's development needs are individually addressed and passed on to schools. But others fear it's another burden for teachers and a potentially stressful extra layer of assessment which could constrain creative teaching and play. Deciding between those two views, of course, depends very much on how you interpret the detail of the foundation stage itself. Sheena. There's a lot to unpack there, Mike. What's provoked this new framework? Why now? Well, I think it's because the government has a very big agenda about trying to narrow the attainment gap, particularly mm. with those between children who come from affluent families where there's a lot of support in, uh, in the home and those where they don't get that. So that's really what this is about. You said it was dubbed a national curriculum for toddlers, um, but it has the same force in law as the national curriculum. So is it not exactly that? Well, in some ways it is a national curriculum for toddlers because, as you say, it is legally covered by it and indeed Ofsted will be checking on it and making sure that uh, these early you know, settings are doing it. But in other ways it's not quite the same because the national curriculum lays down a lot of content that must be covered uh, by children in schools. This gives lots of guidance about areas, but it doesn't lay it down in quite the same way. Nevertheless, there is a real debate about that and we'll hear some different views in a moment. Let's hear, first of all, from Julian Grenier. He's a nursery school school head teacher from North London. 
potentially the pitfall with the EYFS will be if people open the pack, they go straight to the grids, the development matters bits, and they feel that there it is laid out in order what children should be learning and how they should be developing. And then if people start producing plans and have targets for when babies should be able to do different things, then it's all going to go very badly wrong. Because, um, you know, good practice is not about trying to get children to particular targets by particular ages when they're this young. And it's very important that people, you know, avoid that interpretation of the new framework. Interesting, because given the detailed uh, structure of the learning and development areas, surely that misinterpretation is all too likely to happen. There is a definite possibility of that. I mean, after if you think back to when the national curriculum came in for children from five upwards, there's no doubt, although it wasn't meant to be as prescriptive as some teachers thought it was, they were very conscientious and they saw all this paperwork coming out, and there is a lot of paperwork along with this, and they think, well, we must do all of these things rather than some of this being guidance. So let's go for a different view, and let's listen to Ruth Pimental, who is the National Director for Early years at the National Strategies. A lot of what's in there is very familiar and will be very familiar to a lot of practitioners already. They'll recognise things from birth to three matters, they'll also recognise things from the curriculum guidance. And it's really important to tell everybody that there are no tests in the early years foundation stage for young children. The assessment of young children is based on observation, based on a practitioner's own observations of children at play in a range of situations to ascertain where they are in their learning and to actually use that information to plan their next steps, to, to plan where they're going to take the children in their learning and development over the next few weeks and months. And the EYFS is all about bringing it together, bringing together what's already existing and make that into a coherent package of materials. Okay, now this new framework affects both young children and adults in the form of, as you said, childminders, uh, teachers and uh, nursery assistants. Let's look at it from their point of view. How does it affect their work? I think for them initially it might be a little bit scary, but I think the reassurance is that most of these things they're already doing through different forms. As I mentioned right at the beginning there, this is bringing under one umbrella all of this guidance, but it existed in different forms before. It's now got more statutory force. And how do you successfully achieve uh, the correct balance between formal learning at that very early age and, and play? Yeah, that's a crucial, absolutely crucial point, really. It does stress in the documents that it is all about everything in this is delivered through play. But nevertheless, some people are worried that it might not work out that way. Let's listen again to Julian Grenier, uh, the nursery uh, school head teacher. The other difficulty that might come with the EYFS is a feeling that it has kind of set out everything you should do from children all the way from birth to the end of the reception year. And then that in turn would turn teachers, nursery education workers, childminders really into kind of technicians, just pushing children through those different stages and that will really do a big disservice to, to children in England. And I suspect Julian Grenier isn't a lone voice and what, what he's expressing is that the, this universality risks um, getting rid of the, 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 the individualism that each child represents. There is definitely a danger of that as he, as he rightly points out. On the other hand this is all meant to be personalised learning from naught if you like so it's all meant to build on what each individual child is capable of doing and observing what they're doing and then building on that mm. and that's very much something that the, the people who defend this uh, insist on, that they don't want people to become technicians, as Julian Grenier talked about. Uh, let's hear again from Ruth Pimental from the National Strategies. At the very heart of the EYFS, we put forward the principle about each unique child, and that actually the starting point for any work in the early years needs to be really getting to understand that child and work with the child and the family to understand their learning. What we do have in the practice guidance are um, some actual outline of children's learning and development from birth to help practitioners understand what they need to plan for, what they need to look out for, what sort of resourcing they need to think about and that's laid out in the practice guidance. So there will be no toddler tests and yet these very young children will be assessed, how? Yes, the assessment will all be done through observation, no sitting down, no formal sort of reading and writing tests like that, all observation while they're doing their everyday play and activities they're involved in. And they will have to be done, there'll have to be a, a profile filled in as the children come up to five and that will be against a certain grid and there are quite a lot of things that have to be filled in by the teachers and they don't have to use the profile that's offered but they can if they wish. Unpack the detail of that for us please. Okay, well there's quite a lot because in all 
there are 13 assessment scales. Now, the first group cover general development. That's namely dispositions and attitudes, social development, emotional development. The next group cover literacy and numeracy, namely language for communication and thinking, and the linking of sounds and letters. This group also covers reading, writing, numbers as labels and for counting, calculating, and finally shape, space, and measures. Then there's the broader category, knowledge and understanding of the world. And finally, children are assessed on their physical and creative development. Now, against each of these, the practitioner must record a point score from 1 to 9. The descriptions of each level are too numerous to give here, but they are on the DCSF website. However, let me give you a taste of what it means to reach the top level, or level 9, which means a child has fully met the learning goals. So under the heading of emotional development, a child scores 9 if they show a strong and positive sense of self-identity and can express a range of emotions fluently and appropriately. With sounds and letters, they need to be able to use these when reading and writing independently. In writing, they should be communicating with simple phrases or sentences which show some consistency of punctuation. And in numbers, they should be able to recognise, count and order numbers up to 20. That is a mighty span of skills that children have to achieve and teachers have to assess. There is an awful lot there and there is a danger that some people will be over-conscientious about filling it all in and that's certainly a concern that we've heard. Let's hear again from Julian Grenier. When it comes to the assessment of children's development and learning, what would be a very bad idea would be for people to unpack those grids from the pack, turn them into a booklet or a post to tick children's progress off. Children, young children, just do not learn and develop in that sort of neat and orderly way. What will be much better will be if people look at the principles and the practice guidance, look at the practice card about assessment, and continue to do what's already known to be good practice in early education, which is narrative observations, taking observations of children at their work and at their play, thinking about the child's development and their learning, thinking about what will help them to move on next. Tick boxes will not be a good way forward for children in the early years foundation stage. But tick box assessment is surely not what's planned. It's not what the government wants, and indeed the people who've devised this say it's not the case. Let's listen again to Ruth Pimentel. Observation and assessment are the heart of really understanding young children. So being able to spend time observing children, watching them in a range of situations and actually looking at those observations and thinking about what the children are doing and where they need to go to next. That's at the heart of really good teaching and really good work with young children. And that's what we expect practitioners to be finding time to do, to really get to know their children. Well, there's an awful lot of information there, but if you want to find out more, you can get hold of this pack from the government, from the Department for Children, Schools and Families. Sheena. You can also find out more on our website at www.teachers.tv. Until the next programme, thanks very much, Mike, and see you next time. Goodbye.